Okay, um, so my talk is on robustness in machine learning explanations, and it's kind of, the summary of it is that it's using lessons from philosophy of science to argue that we should look for robust machine learning explanations. So, a uh, summary of my main argument, um, I kind of start with the question of what are we explaining when we construct machine learning explanations. I think this question has been not directly addressed often in the machine learning explanation literature. Um, and if we think about that question, and we, if we think that part of what we're explaining includes relationships in the real world, not just uh, in relationships that our model makes up, um, then we should run robust explanations. And by robust, I'm, go I'm going to, that, by, robustness, by robustness, I mean something roughly like multiple methods converging on the same explanation. And to clarify, robustness in this sense is not the same as getting robust outputs or predictions. I'm talking about the robustness of the explanation. So, for example, you want robust feature importance rankings. You want your multiple methods to converge on the same feature importance rankings. Um, and sometimes in literature, this, notion, this robustness is called stability. Um, so it's this, I'm just using a different term, an uh, uh, alternate, uh, alternate term for it. Um, and I argue that robustness, robust explanations are better for gaining true knowledge about the world and also they're good, to, good for helping us avoid moral hazard when we provide explanations to stakeholders. Okay, so um, I have a slide on types of explanations that I'll go through briefly because I feel like we've been through these themes for a while, but in this talk when I say interpretable models, I'm talking about models that have inherently interpretable math. For example, linear models where it's very easy to extract um, the relevant features and their effect on the results. Uh, and then black box model is one that's not interpretable. Uh, and then post hoc or sur surrogate, surrogate or post hoc explanations, I just mean um, models that mimic a black box model's behavior, um, but which are interpretable so you can extract the explanation from the post hoc um, model. Okay, so moving on to um, the question of what we're explaining. Um, so um, I, this is a schematic of the different objects or relationships that we are trying to explain when we create an explanation. Um, so we have the world from which the data is collected, and then we have the model which turns the data input into an output. Um, um, okay, so in the case of post hoc explanations, um, what you get from what a post hoc explanation is explaining is that it's explaining how the data input relates to the output, but without relation to the actual black box model. So most post hoc explanations, especially if they're model agnostic, which most of them are, um, they are um, not really, they, they, can be, they can be applied without any, any relation to the actual black box model's um, internal mechanisms. So what they're explaining doesn't actually include the black box model. In the case of interpretable models, we are explaining not just data input and its relation to model output, we're also explaining the internal mechanisms of the model. Um, so we're explaining a different thing and um, we're explaining more things than we are in the case of post hoc explanations. Um, and so in the case of, um, so there are some applications to machine learning that are sort of more scientific, I have quotes for a reason, um, where we are actually concerned about explaining relationships in the real world. Um, and in this case, these cases, um, I would argue that what we're explaining includes um, relationships in the world and not just what's in the model, what's in the, input, what's, the data, what's in the data and what's in the output. So for example, when you want to explain um, what kinds of, if you have a model that predicts you know, the risk of stroke given the patient's characteristics, uh, it's, um, you want it to have some grounding in real world relationships and so part of what you're explaining is relationships in the real world. Okay, so now this is the sort of like philosophy of science part. Um, so there's this principle that uh, has been long known to social, um, uh, social scientists and biological scientists um, is this idea that the more we're able to derive one result in different ways, the more we have confidence that that result is real. And so I'm going to apply this principle to, to explanations. There are some, uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot of history arguments for, these, uh, for why we should have this principle. I'm just going to go through some of them quickly. These are not new to me, it's just in the literature. Uh, so, for example, what, the re one reason you might want to have multiple methods is that if one method, if each method makes some problematic assumptions, then the result is more likely to be true if it's independent of those assumptions, and you can ensure its independence by making sure that each of those methods all have the same result, even though they have different assumptions. Uh, and then there's the consideration that if you can get the same result from small perturbations in input data, then the result is independent of errors in the data. Um, and then finally, there's a kind of probabilistic argument where the idea is that if you have multiple methods, that converge on one result, then um, it's more, it's more uh, insensitive to errors in individual method. Whereas if you're on the right hand side, if you have only one method, then you, you just need one step in the method to be wrong for your result to be wrong. So it's more vulnerable to, um, um, 
errors in your, in your knowledge. Okay, so there are some examples of non-robust explanations that we already know about. Uh, so we know that Lime and Shep uh, are not robust. There's a paper about that. Uh, because if you, you can show that you can, if you, you can perturb the input data for Lime and Shep, um, and you can show that the prediction is not affected, but that the explanation is affected by a lot. So uh, even though the outputs are robust, the explanation itself is not. So this is not ideal if we think the explanation is something like out there in the world that's objective. Um, and then there's another case that's a kind of like a well-known effect in literature. There's something called the multiplicity of good models and the Welshman effect with the idea that uh, for a given data set and given predictive goal, you can often find multiple models that perform almost equally well. But each of these models may, each of them correspond to very different explanations. So there's no consensus among these different models about what the explanations are. Um, so why do we have buses as reality for machine learning explanations? Um, One reason is that um, if we're actually um, improving our model in, in, in accordance with real patterns in the world, um, then we're actually better, a better able to kind of engineer our features better. Um, we also have more trust in the model because we know they reflect something that's out there in the world. Um, so that's one reason for hypothesis generation and model improvement. Another reason is that um, estimations, I think, are often used um, as justifications. Um, so in many cases, when you provide an explanation to a stakeholder, let's say you made a credit decision, the, the end user who gets the explanation expects it to not just be explaining math, but also to be justifying your decision. In this case, it, you know, um, if, you provide, if your justification includes real world um, properties and something that actually happens in real world, then there's more, there's more reason for the, for, the, for the stakeholder to believe in the explanation to trust you. And then finally, there's, a, there's another reason for um, wanting robust society is that there's a kind of moral hazard. Um, uh, it's, in, it's been called fair washing, where you can have methods to generate basically like 100 post hoc explanations. And then you can cherry pick the ones that don't use prohibited attributes um, and present them to the user. And in this case, I think it's a kind of misleading explanation because you're, you're hiding from the, fact, from the user the fact that there are like 99 other explanations that are just as good, but that use prohibited attributes, for example. Um, so I don't have time to go through this, but uh, um, there's an objection that we shouldn't use uh, machine learning models, we shouldn't use, uh, that we shouldn't care about reality because machine learning models are not causal anyway. I don't think this really works because um, even if the machine learning models are not exact representation of causality, we still want them to have some relation to reality and there's no like sharp distinction between predictive only models and, and causal models. Um, I'm out of I have five seconds. so. Um, uh, in conclusion, we should care about robust explanations because they matter for ethical and epistemic reasons. So that's all.